Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Francesco and with this video we're going to be covering topic four which is going to be about figuring out on the Ontario Building Codes method of determining how many people are going to be in a building or in a specific space. Now this method only works or the, the way that we're going to cover it is only for part three buildings and we learned in the previous topic, topic three, how to differentiate between part nine and part three buildings. But be aware of this. Everything that we're covering today is for part three buildings only. Now, for the purposes of this topic, I want to set the scene for you. Imagine that you're in one of these spaces. Let's say that you're in an airplane hangar and you're looking around. How many people do you expect to see in a space like that? Compare that, say, to a transit station. If you're looking around, how many people do you expect to see in a place like that? Or maybe compare that against an office setting. Uh, I don't know, there's lots of people there maybe, depending on what office you're working on. How many people do you expect to see in a place like that? Well, depending on what space you're in, the number of people expected to be in it will be different. And what we're going to try to answer today is to how does the Ontario Building Code determine the occupant load, which is a fancy way of saying how many people are expected to be in that specific space given its major occupancy. This is important because as you can imagine, depending on what space you're in, it will affect how many washrooms to have, the number and sizes of exit doors and corridors, anything related to firefighting activities and requirements, Heck, even the number of exit stairs, the width of exit stairs, and so on and so forth. The occupant load affects all of these things and more. Okay? So what I'm going to do for this topic is, like I did in the previous one, I'm going to give you some ingredients that we're going to be using together to figure out the occupant load. So today, again, we're cooking by using these ingredients. The three ingredients that we're going to be using are major occupancy, the area affected, and table 3.1.17.1 in division B, which will give us a factor that we're going to be using with the other information here. Okay? Now, let me show you a bit more of this table, table 3.1.17.1. So, come along. Let me see if I can show this to you right here and maybe let me zoom in that'll be most helpful there we go we have the table here and the way that this table is set up is that it is invoked by this article article 3.1.17.1 right here it's under this subsection occupant load interestingly enough and this article is all about determining so calculating the occupant load the way this table is set up as you can see, is under this column, it contains factors. So numbers that somehow I'm going to show you how they're used to calculate the number of people using a space. The other thing that you can see from this table is that it's kind of set up in big rows. You see these vertical uh, horizontal lines here? They're separating big rows. And the neat thing about these rows is that they're arranged by major occupancy. So for example, the first row is assembly occupancies. So these are all the A type major occupancies. Okay, maybe I'm going to make it a bit bigger. There we go. The next one is B type major occupancies. Okay, so that's where the care, care and treatment and detention uses comes in. The next one, can you guess at what the major occupancy is? It's residential. So that's C major occupancies right here. Okay. And on the paper version of the Ontario Building Code, I actually go in there and write the letters for all the major occupancies so I never make a mistake. The next one over, the next row is uh, business and personal services right here. This one here is E, mercantile right here. Uh, this one here is industrial, so it's F buildings. 
And here is other. Now, the way that other works is that you only use other, this row here, if your major occupancy or if your building does not immediately fall in any of the other rows that you see up here. Okay? But you can see basically how this is arranged. Every row here contains a major occupancy. And then within that row, you also have some more detail to help you refine what value to take in that table. Okay, so don't forget A through F, and then you only move on to the other row if none of the other ones apply. Okay, all right, let's come back right here. So what I was thinking is that maybe we could take some time and practice using this information by doing an example, because the best way to learn is by doing, right? Even if we make a mistake, we'll learn from it. So here we have this example. Let's determine the occupant load. And notice how occupant load is written, right? That means it's a defined term. So de determine the number of people for 1,000 meters squared of office space. So we're going to use these three ingredients to figure out the occupant load for 1,000 square meters of office space. Let's start with the major occupancy. So ingredient number one. We covered this in topic two. I think it was. And using the knowledge from topic two, office, we find it is a D major occupancy. It's called business and personal services. And these are the references that we would use to determine that information. Okay, good. I'm going to update this information here about the major occupancy. It's D. Good. The next item is the area, 1,000 square meters. It's given there. So I'm just going to update that information here. The third and final ingredient to do all of this is to find the correct factor from table 3.1.17.1. So how about I bring that up right here? Okay, here's the table itself, 3.1.17.1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what I learned in the first ingredient, major occupancy, to identify the correct row. Our major occupancy is right here, D business and personal services. And in that row, we have two options, personal services, shop, and offices. Our building, we're told, is an office building. So it's offices that we're going to be using. And then we find the corresponding factor right here, which is 9.30. You see it at the far right column? That's the corresponding factor for offices, which is the value that we're going to be using right here. That's the value that we're going to be putting right in there. So once we put that value in there, this factor, then we're going to be using that factor in a specific way with this area. Let me show you. Now calculation we're going to be doing, this factor here, that area there, we're going to divide them. So we're going to take the area, 1000 meters square, divided by the factor, which is in meters squared per person, like that. So 1000 meters squared divided by 9.30 meters squared per person gives us unit wise people, persons. Now, I wrote this number just to be silly. I didn't have to write all of it. I could have stopped at the first decimal or the second decimal. Okay. But nonetheless, this is the number we get. It's not a whole number. So do we round this up? Do we round it down? The question is a valid one round up or round down because People are whole numbers, right? You can't have 0 0.526881720404 of a person, regardless of a person's size, okay? People are numbered as 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. We are whole numbers. So do we round up or round down? The answer is you always round up, always. Because as soon as there is a decimal place after a number calculation for people, that means more than. So in our case here, having 107.5266 blah, 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 means more than 107 people. And the only whole number, the smallest whole number that's more than 107 people 
is 108. Don't forget, people are whole numbers, okay? So that's the number of people that are expected to be using 1,000 meters squared of office space. Let's do another example. Example number two, we're going to use these same three ingredients to figure out the occupant load for the fourth story of an apartment building. And that apartment building, that fourth story, has three two-bedroom suites. So there are three suites, and each suite is a two-bedroom suite. Okay, let's figure that out. We're going to use, again, the three ingredients from our list. The first one we're going to start with is major occupancy. Based on what we learned in topic two, we know that an apartment building is a residential or a C major occupancy, and we use Appendix A and this table to figure out that information. Let's move on to the second item, our second ingredient, the area, after I've updated this ingredient. Turns out, I haven't given you an area, but that's because, as I'm about to show you, in this case, it's not relevant. And in order for me to show you that, we have to move on to the third ingredient, which is the factor from table 3.1.17.1. So let me bring that up right here. Okay. So we are looking for a C major occupancy. So that's residential uses right here. And that's why I like to label with the letters so I can go right away. And within residential occupancies, I have two options. I have dwelling units and dormitory. Dwelling units refers to basically a space that you can eat, sleep, uh, and use to live in, which is what an apartment building is with apartments with bedrooms in it. Okay. Now, you'll notice that dwelling units also is written at a slant. So that means that it's specifically defined in the Ontario Building Code. Go read that definition, but it's applicable in this case. So what happens is for dwelling units, the corresponding factor is this. It's a small number in circular brackets. Do you know what that means? It refers to the notes below the table. So this is note number two, which says C clause 3.1.17.1, 1B. You find that clause right above here, 1B. And what it says is that in a space that has dwelling units, each person is required, is you have to account for two people sleeping per sleeping room. Okay? So what that means is that basically when it comes to an apartment bu building or an apartment space with bedroom suites, one bedroom equals two people. One bedroom equals two people is what this says. So that's why the area is not relevant. It's only based for dwelling units on the number of bedrooms. Okay. So if one bedroom equals two people, then how do we calculate the occupant load for three two bedroom suites? Okay. One bedroom equals two people. So two bedrooms equals four people. If we have three of these two bedrooms, then three two bedrooms equals three times four people, which is 12 people. There's your answer. Make sense? Now with this information, you can actually also do the homework and we've kind of covered all, hey, I know what this sound is. That means that we've reached the end of our video. Like I was trying to say before I interrupted myself, we're now ready for you to do homework one, question four, which will get you to practice to do the calculations for occupant load. And that also brings us to the end of this video. Our next video is going to be topic five, where we're going to, you're going to learn about the effects of building size and construction relative to occupancy. I hope to see you there. Bye.